meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeal, Town of Cape Elizabeth. I'd like to start out with the roll call, starting to our right, please. Steve LaPlante. Jim Wolf. Len Galino. I'm Jay Chapmas. Joe Fulimetti. We have two board members absent this evening. Uh, and we'll proceed on. Uh, we do have a quorum present, five or seven board members. The first item on the agenda, the first uh, item of order is to approve the minutes of the March, I'm sorry, the June, June 25th meeting, I believe. I was absent of the zoning, uh, last zoning board. Any comments on the, the minutes, please? I believe one amendment is in order on page eight, line four. The vote that was taken was a motion to deny the appeal um, of the order to correct the stop work order as opposed to approve the appeal. Um, I thought of, I was thinking about that and I think the motion was made in the affirmative. Uh, to, approve, to approve yeah, your that's the procedural way to, to, uh, to word a motion. Um, but uh, the rest of it is a little confusing, isn't it? Oh, that's right. Okay, and the vote was uh, okay. It was denied. Okay, you're right. You're correct. So I was, take that back. Um, in the, I mean, in the, I'm not sure the wor the wording's a little confusing. though, beyond that, isn't it? I agree with you. That's right. It was uh, the, the the motion was denied. Any other comments regarding the June 22nd minutes? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Seconded. Motion's been seconded. All those in favor? I'm abstaining, abstaining since I was not present. I want to thank Gib Mendelson for taking my place at the last meeting since I was unable to attend to an out-of-town trip. Uh, there's no old business, new business, which is an update of an, or, and related to uh, uh, the uh, appeal of the last meeting. I'd like to make a brief summary in, in my absence, if anyone would correct me. Uh, there was an appeal at the last meeting uh, regarding the building height of the structure at uh, 52 Shipwreck Cove Road. It was determined that the building height was adequate, but the uh, original grade was in violation of the code. That was determined with uh, through affidavits, surveys, photos, personal recollections, and other items of supporting documentation. Uh, the board uh, reviewed that and requested an appeal of the uh, uh, support of the code enforcement officer that the building height was in excess. This was adjusted, recommendations were made, uh, and, and this stop work order was approved and items that were suggested were corrected. In summary, I hope that's correct. I would just uh, modify that. I think the only thing that was um, brought before the board the last time was um, an appeal of the CEO's issuance of a cease and desist order. And this, um, so the only issue before us was whether or not to uh, grant the appeal or not. And the request for um, um, the appeal was denied. In other words, it was voted down. And I don't think there was any conditions or <coughs> requirements or conditions placed upon that decision. In other words, there was no decision by this board as to what remedial steps, if any, were required to bring it within code. Thank you. We have a new appeal regarding the same property today brought to us by Pellet Penny Pollard and Erilyn Rothman of number one and number three 
Peebles Point Lane. Uh, there's also a Shipwreck Cove address associated with at least one of those properties, I believe. Uh, that described a grievance to appeal the decision to lift the stop work order of 52 Shipwreck Cove Road. Additionally, why was the site plan review not required? Specific sections of the ordinance at issue, height restriction 35 feet. We'll proceed with that. Will either or both Penny Pollard or Marilyn Rothman please come to the podium or your representatives and introduce yourself, state your address, and present your application. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bill Greenberg. Um, I'm Arlen Rothman's husband, and I also uh, own property at One People's Point Lane. Um, and I'd like to address the board with a uh, short argument. Okay. Is this the same as what it came through on the PDF file? The modification. Okay, so best to destroy this. Yeah. Mr. Chair, before we begin, can we identify, perhaps for, for the board and for everyone else, exactly what we are hearing, or what will be what will be within the scope of the um, discussions tonight, and what is pertinent exactly? <clears throat> so I guess I'm confused because would a site plan normally be required for a residential development? I, I looked through the ordinance and I didn't see that that was the case. Uh, I agree. You are correct, and I was going to let them make a presentation and, and present that first uh, in regard in review in regards to the site plan review. Uh, to answer your question, according to the ordinance, the site plan review is not required for residential mm -hmm. uh, uh, construction, and and uh, so it appears that that the second part of this is is not within our scope of, of review since it does not apply. Okay. I guess I just wanted to make sure that um, the expectations were set as to what we'll be hearing and exactly what's pertinent to what needs to be discussed tonight and what we'll be voting on and, within was, and what is within the purview of the discussions. For the benefit of us as well as the audience, I'd like to hear what the applicants do have as far as their plans and their, their, their ideas. <laughs> Excuse me. Our, our, our primary one sorry. point: <clears throat> the, the second part does apply to you because that's a direct question to this board. So you need to make a decision whether whether it does require site plan review or not. So that isn't a closed issue. You you'll have to decide whether that's a, whether a site plan review is required under that. Understood. We not at this point in time, but ultimately we right. do. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Greenberg. Me, I, sorry for the interruption. No problem at all. Uh, Thank you. Uh, the, we're actually going to bring up three specific points. Uh, the first and primary point is going to be that we still believe the building to be uh, not in compliance with the height restriction. And that's going to be the, the primary thrust of my presentation. Um, there are also uh, two other item or issues that will be uh, put forward. And the first is uh, the determination of the f what the front of the lot is and uh, that has bearing on uh, setbacks uh, to the building. And the third thing uh, indeed had to do with um, the, the need for a site plan review. And it's true that it says in the ordinance that ordinarily for um, residential uh, construction of single family uh, residences, that's, uh, it's not required to do a site plan review. But another section of the, of the ordinance says that whenever there's any uh, disturbing, uh, whenever more than 10,000 square feet of vegetation is either modified or removed, uh, then a site plan is required. And there was more than 10,000 square feet of uh, vegetation removed on this lot, not directly associated with um, with the building of the, of the, of the home. Um, the, the home could have been built without 
such clearing and so that's why we thought that that was an issue but we can leave that for discussion later if you if you care to ok so what i've just passed out to you is a set of powerpoint charts that i generated uh... and i'll be stepping through these one at a time uh... in our argument that to convince you that we believe that the house is still not in compliance with the zoning ordinance so uh... as i move through it if there are questions please interrupt me and i'll be happy to clarify or answer your questions at that point uh... so the at the last meeting uh... the uh... stop worker order was uh... left in place and subsequent to that modified modified plans were filed uh... with code enforcement officer to reduce the height of the uh... of the building by some two point uh... two feet four inches in order to bring it into compliance with the current interpretation of the zoning ordinance but and at that point then the, the stop work order was lifted uh... and uh... work has continued on the site however we feel that uh... the house is still not in compliance uh... and in fact it never has been in compliance the, the original plans that were filed were not in compliance and so uh... we take issue with the both the, the uh... reinstatement of sorry the lifting of the stop work order as well as the initial uh... issuance of the of the um, uh, uh, construction uh, sorry the building permit uh... in the first place so that that's what i'm here to convince you of so if you turn to uh... slide number three then i start with uh... the building height definition that's directly from the zoning ordinance section nineteen dash one dash three and it reads that the vertical distance from the average original grade to the top of the highest roof beams of a flat roof or to the mean level of the highest gable or slope of a hip roof that's exactly and all that the uh... that the ordinance says does not speak directly to a gambrel style roof which is what this building has um, and so the interpretation of the phrase mean level of the highest gable or slope of the hip roof uh, is the key i believe to determining what the ordinance is asking us to do in terms of determining building height currently the town is using something that i refer to as the mean level of the entire roof um, as it was explained to me uh, the basically the the distance from the bottom of the roof system to the peak is measured and, and we take half of that in order to reach the mean level and then that mean level is compared to the highest grade and you determine what the building height is um, and that's very straightforward for a simple peak roof uh, but roof systems with multiple slopes as is the case here uh, should be evaluated differently uh, as I will uh, point out as we proceed through here so what I'd like to do is uh, show you a couple of uh, examples um, of how the system works and so uh, turn to, to chart number four, which is a, a very rough schematic of the, uh, the house at 52 Shipwreck Cove Road as it was originally filed. And uh, the dimensions on the, on the left-hand side there are in feet and are approximate values, but very close. And if you use the technique uh, that is currently in, uh, being used, uh, as shown at the bottom, uh, the building height can be computed to be 35 feet. And that takes into account a three foot foundation, 23 foot high walls, and then 18 feet worth of, um, worth of roof system. Now the, the actual peak height uh, uh, from the original grade is, is 44 feet if you add up those, just the numbers on the left hand side. All right, so that, that's the, the house that was origin, as it was originally filed. If you turn to chart number five then, I've chosen another example of a similar kind of system, a, a similar kind of house, only this house has three separate angles in its roof. And the dimensions of it are shown on the left. And again, if you apply the technique currently in use, you, you determine that this house is also 35 feet high. Um, However, the, the peak height of this house is 52 feet. So, uh, so there's a difference there, but we'll, we'll come back to that in just a moment. 
If instead we, we uh, went back to the, to the wording of the ordinance and used what is referred to as the mean level of the highest slope, which I believe is what the ordinance was trying to get at in terms of complex roofs with, with multiple gables or multiple angles, things like that. I believe that that's what uh, was intended to be uh, the, the technique. So if you use that method, then uh, the, uh, the example A turns out to be 39 and a half feet, and example B turns out to be 47.5 feet. So turning to chart number seven, it, it gives you a summary and a comparison of the two methods uh, for, for easy comparison. So example A has a peak that's 44 feet from the original grade. Example B has a peak which is 52 feet from the original grade, a difference of eight feet. Using the technique which I'm calling the mean level of the entire roof, both of those buildings are the same height. Which doesn't seem quite right. However, if you use the mean level of the highest slope, the differentiation is there. There is eight feet between 39.5 and 47.5 feet, which is the same difference as the, in the difference in the peak height. Now, it makes an allowance for the fact that it's a peak roof, which I believe is also the intent of the ordinance, and that is to allow peak roofs, in fact, encourage peak roofs uh, to add uh, uh, <clears throat> perhaps to the aesthetics of, of the house. But in any case, I believe the intent of the ordinance was to encourage peak roofs or sloped roofs. Mr. Greenberg, may I inter uh, interrupt you for just a sure. moment? Uh, everything you're discussing at, to this point has to do with the determination of the roof design and the mean level, all of which are relevant to the issuance of the building permit. Uh, which was issued in November. I'd like to, to it is, I'd like to ask the board members for their opinion. I, I won't interrupt you and apologize uh, uh, me for doing that, but I'd like to ask the men, uh, opinion of the board members uh, in regards to this. According to uh, section 19-5-3, page 49, of the zoning ordinance uh, procedures, any person agreed by decision of the code enforcement officer or other municipal official where applicable may appeal such decision to the board within 30 days following the date of such decision by fil filing a notice of appeal with the code enforcement officer. The building permit was applied for last November is my understanding. At that point, 30 days were available this type of response and to challenge and question the code enforcement officer uh, decision to uh, to issue the building permit. Uh, since that was uh, last November, we're outside of that 30 days. Obviously, I, it, it bringing up the determination of the roof profile and the determination of the mean height. Uh, my understanding is not within our jurisdiction eight months later. I, like I understand that. that. Let me ask board members if... if I'm going to address exactly your question, sir. Thank you. Um, and in fact, uh, at the end, I will show you that not only wasn't it in compliance in the first place, it's still not in compliance. And so that's why it bears directly on the code enforcement officer's decision to uh, lift the stop work order. And I believe that was incorrect because the building is still uh, too high. And so uh, I'm stepping through this argument in order to uh, try and convince you that the basic technique that's used to determine both initially as well as currently whether or not the, the board is, uh, sorry, the house is in compliance uh, is, is not correct. Okay. Let me ask, uh, let me mention one other thing that I, I did. We, we all received, I believe all of us received uh, uh, your presentation your, uh, in PDF format prior, and I, I think it was a well thought out, well done, well explained presentation, and I do appreciate your time and, and your input, I, I, and I read it with interest, as I, uh, and as I hope other board members did also. Um, Again, we are faced, the, the charge of our board is to uh, interpret the ordinance. 
uh, within the 30 days, we had full jurisdiction of the building permit to challenge the code enforcement office, officer, alter, request additional information, data, and everything else. Beyond that 30-day period, uh, according to the ordinance, we have very little uh, ability to affect that. I'm not saying it's, it's something we want to do or not want to do, but according to the ordinance, yep. uh, we had 30 days, you had 30 days to approach the board. That's correct. And, and, and uh, unless you present information, uh, and I'm not even sure that we can affect the building permit at this time. The building permit was issued. And okay, there, that's... I don't know if the other board members would like to comment at this time. Or... Well, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested in Mr. Greenberg's uh, thoughts as to why the 30-day limitation of 19-5-3 shouldn't control in this circumstance. I believe it should, and as the primary thing that I'm challenging is the lifting of the stop work order. That, that occurred less, our, our uh, appeal of that took place within the 30 days uh, as called for in the ordinance. So what you're saying in the first, the first place, when the actual building permit was issued, you believe that 30 days should be on it in place. You're questioning what we did at our last meeting. Yes. Um, in addition, I'm pointing out that I don't believe that the, that the, uh, the building permit was issued properly in the first place. Now, okay, let me stop you there. We, we cannot comment on that, and, and, and I, I hope you understand. Once a building permit is issued, then the applicant has certain vested rights that the town, through the authority of the building permit, has issued and provided. Uh, a guarantee, uh, uh, vested rights is probably the best way to describe this. And at that point, uh, that, is, that is for the protection of the, the builder, uh, the homeowner at that point. So we do not have the authority at this point to modify or adjust or even comment on the original building permit. So it's my feeling that we should address simply what the appeal is, and that was to lift the stop work order. Okay. Um, so Thank in that you. case, but I, I'm also interested in what you have to say okay. in regards to lifting the. And, and I'm not trying to cut you short on that at all. So. Okay. Thank you. So. Um, can I ask a question? Thank you. Sure, go ahead. Can I, I'm sorry. Can I ask a question? If if a rule you need to approach sorry. the podium and introduce yourself. And My name is Penny Pollard. And I just had a question, if a rule of law has been violated in the actual construction, not the permit issuance, you know, so what was permitted is one thing, and then what was built is another thing. Is that not something that can be addressed? If, if, if plans... Uh, if, if plans if, were if, violated... If, if plans were submitted and those plans were followed, then, then those plans should be expected to be followed. If plans were submitted, those plans should be followed. Right, so, so what I'm asking is, if there is an ordinance in place that was violated, is that not what we are able to address in a, a zoning board of appeals? Uh, again, your point is understood. There are 30 days in which we can address that issue according to that's that's law. for the permitted but I'm, I'm talking the permit for the drawings is one thing if then in the construction a code of law is violated then that gets to be addressed are you asserting that the plans that were that the building um, permit was for have been modified during the construction that the house specified during the permitting process was somehow modified, so what was yielded during the construction is not what was planned? Yeah. Well, I, that's one thing that I'm addressing, yes. I, th I think, from, from my standpoint anyways, that the, the determination on how the mean level was, was determined mm -hmm. was made in November. Uh, the fact that he exceeded it is an issue the reason why we put the stop on. Right. The modification 
is the reason why the stop auto was lifted. Was lifted. Yeah. Now, if there's a reason why the, that that modification by itself not put it, and not bring it in the fact that the mean level was already determined in November, right. then I think you can focus on that. But I don't see, from my standpoint anyways, and I don't know how the board feels, but the mean level was determined in November. And that really can't change and, unless there's a modification to the ordinance. I don't know. Uh, at least, I, uh, uh, well, let's put it this way. It could change if, if but the determination that the building permit issued was made in November. And that right. can't really change. Only within the 30 day window. Because otherwise, people could come in one year, two years, whatever, anytime. Right. I randomly understand that. Try to block somebody from doing something that they had in good faith gotten a permit for. So there has to be some kind of a window of opportunity, yeah. but also there has to be some time when people can faithfully go forward without having, having to worry about I, I think this is a unique condition. It certainly is a unique situation. And, so. and I think that there are things about this structure that could not have been imagined until the structure was actually in place. So I think that there are extenuating circumstances that need to be taken in cons into consideration with this structure based on uh, you know, a lot of different ordinances, and not just the, hu the height, but the height is the one that seems the obvious one to address. Mr. Smith, has seemed to be. Did, um, did the abutters receive notice of the original permit in any fashion so that they're aware the no. 30 days was ticking off? No, no, that was addressed at the last meeting. Not, 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 no, nor did the other 600, the butters to the 600 other building permits I issue. That, that, that isn't something that the town currently does not that we can't have a change to that either but uh, most towns don't have a method to do that some towns do uh, and there are ways to address that um. in fact we were aware of the fact that the uh, property had changed hands and uh, we stopped in to see Bruce in October asked him whether or not there had been any plans filed uh, we don't we have a summer cottage and we don't come up in the winter time um, and at the time that we left in late October, no plans had been filed, uh, but by the time we returned in the spring, the work had begun already. But in, um, to go back to the, to the point that was made previously about determination of the, the, mean, uh, the mean level, that's an interpretation that was made and in good faith, uh, but it was an interpretation. I think it's the wrong interpretation. And, Nevertheless, that same interpretation had to be made in order to lift this stop work order. So each time that interpretation is made, I believe that it can be questioned. And that's why I'm questioning it now. I didn't have the opportunity to question it before, but I'm questioning it now. And if you just let me finish my argument, I'll show you why I believe that there's a better technique to be used that better addresses at least what I see as the intent of the uh, ordinance. What is the feeling of the board? I would like to hear his arguments. The other thing I would like to know is whether or not anybody is present from 52 Shipwrecks Cove to address their side of the argument or not. Well, actually, there's, there's no re requirement for somebody at 52 Shipwreck Cove to... I, I'm not suggesting there are, but I just wanted to know whether or not we're going to be hearing from the other side. Okay. Um, so I just, it, it's relatively brief from this point forward. Um, so just to reiterate, uh, the method that's currently in use would find uh, a building, two buildings that, whose peak height differ by a factor by some eight feet to be exactly the same height. Whereas there's a different technique which could be applied, which uh, allow, which, which uh, discerns that, that difference of, of eight feet. So. Turning to, cha to uh, chart number eight then, um, I say in words what I just said. And in fact, if you continue this argument to the extreme, you could put up a 70-foot house, a house with a 70-foot uh, uh, peak height. And if it was all roof, essentially like an A-frame, it would be a 35-foot house. You could do that under either interpretation, yours or his, or the CEO's. True enough. 
200. Correct. But nevertheless, I'm not sure that that was what was intended by, by the framers of the ordinance. Um, so uh, because the, the, the technique that I'm suggesting meets the intent of the zoning ordinance better than the mean level of the entire roof system, uh, I believe it should be, it's what should be used in determining a compliance with the, with the zoning ordinance. And it, it's suggested also in the wording. While, as I mentioned at the outset, the wording doesn't exactly address a Gambrel uh, style roof, but I believe that that's the closest thing. So initially then, uh, I would say that the, the original plans were not in uh, compliance and a building per permit shouldn't have been issued. We've been over, uh, I understand that, that the 30 day um, period for that has expired. But let me, um, let me continue. I'll skip to, uh, item 10. We don't believe that the, this, the current build, building permit was properly issued. And it seems, though, that a matter of law like this uh, shouldn't come under the, the commentary on, on the, uh, the issuance of the, of the uh, building permit. And that since there was an incorrect interpretation made, then that should invalidate the, the building permit. Nevertheless, that's, of course, up, for, up to you to decide. But let's get to, uh, to Mr. Chatmus's uh, question, and that is, the House has currently filed, is it or is it not in compliance? And I believe that if you apply the technique that I just explained to you to the, to the House as currently filed, you'll see that it is also more than 35 feet high. And that's what example C shows you on chart number 11. These are um, measurements uh, taken from uh, the, the drawings. Um, it was determined, the original drawing called for a, a foundation that was uh, three feet from the original grade. It was determined that that was in error by some uh, 14 inches at the last meeting. So that's something like four and a quarter feet for that uh, foundation. The walls are then 23 feet high before it goes into the roof system. And the roof is as shown with the peak removed in order to uh, re uh, bring down, bring it down the two feet, four inches that was required uh, as a result of the last meeting. So uh, by the mean level of the entire roof approach, you come up with a building that's 35 feet high. However, if you use the mean level of the highest slope technique, which I'm suggesting, that house is actually nearly 40 feet high and in excess of the 35 feet called for in the ordinance. Mr. Smith, is the roof in fact flat on the top now? No, it's got a somewhat some pitch to it. Very little. But. So, and it's, do you agree with his calculations here? In what respect? In the sense that the in the sense that the measurements are accurate. I not that it's cal not that you agree with his calculation. I understand you mm -hmm. apply the mean level of entire roof approach to calculating the, the height. That's correct. And. Are these numbers that he's putting forth here is the actual dimensions of the building? I didn't look at that closely, but the, the numbers that I was concerned with upon issuing this building permit are, are accurate. I'm sorry. It's quite all right. In fact, I was giving the, this house the benefit of the doubt that it didn't have a flat roof because there was only a small section that was flat, but in the strict interpretation, whether it has a slight pitch to it or whether it's indeed flat, you would have, you could use that level as the as the mean level. I guess uh, I should go on record that that even if it was flat, because it's such a small portion that it probably would meet the definition of a pitched roof. It, I'm sorry. It, it probably would meet the definition of a pitched roof even though it's flat, but it's not flat. So I didn't really look at that carefully. You say it would meet the definition. I, I think it still would. I, like I say, I haven't no, so study that. But there, I, I looked, and there doesn't seem to be any kind of a uh, specific uh, definition for what a flat roof is, and so that's why I also gave them the benefit of the doubt. Um, but this will be a, a, a very important point as we look down the road a little bit, which will come up on the next chart. So 
So this house, the, the highest level now, it's not really a peak anymore, is some 42 and three quarters feet um, above uh, the original grade. Um, and by the, the uh, mean level of the highest slope technique, it uh, measures up just shy of 40 feet. So I believe it is still not in compliance. So then on my last chart, uh, the, the last conclusion is exactly that, that, uh, that the house is still not in compliance. And to address uh, Mr. Gilino's um, uh, point, if you continue to remove the, the roof structure in order to try and bring it into compliance, I believe then you would reach uh, the point where you had a flat roof that would still be a, a very small pitched a, uh, area, but primarily the roof would be flat. And at that point, it would still be in excess of 35 feet. So it's my feeling that the design of this house needs signi uh, significant uh, modification in order to bring it into compliance with the zoning ordinance. And so I definitely believe that uh, lifting of the stop work order was uh, improper. And although it's been discussed uh, pretty heavily here, I believe that the initial issuance was improper as well. But uh, the most important, obviously, uh, in your minds is that uh, the stop work order is improper because I believe that the, the building is still in excess of 35 feet. Sir, would it, under your definition, though, if they just made it a straight peak roof, it would comply, right? If you had no break in the roof and it was just a vertical side and then a normal roof. Yep, that's it, true. It would and comply with your definition. That's correct. And the, the, the implication there is as follows. Currently, this is a three-story house. It has three full stories in it. Um, some 7,800 square feet, 25, in excess of 2,500 square feet per floor. Um, I believe that if you put a regular roof on it, a regular peak roof, as you suggest, then it would be two floors plus perhaps some uh, additional space on a third floor, but it wouldn't be a full third floor. And the overall impact of such a huge structure um, would be considerably softened by having it only two floors high as opposed to three floors high. And that's one of the main things I believe that uh, all the, the neighbors object to is that th this house is so out of proportion and s uh, uh, so unlike anything else in its general neighborhood, which is another expressed goal of the ordinance, but uh, admittedly somewhat unenforceable. But the whole idea of the ordinance is to allow for development that is in, uh, in concert with its surroundings. And this house sticks out like a sore thumb. You can see it from miles out at sea. You can see it uh, from many hundreds of uh, yards away because it is so much larger than anything else around it. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to reduce that overall impact. And I believe that that goal would be substantially uh, uh, obtained by reducing this house to, to a two-floor house um, as opposed to a three-floor house. And, and the use of the Gambrel roof enables them that third floor. Say the last statement again, the use of Gambrel. The use of the Gambrel roof enables them a full third floor, because basically it was also expressed at the last meeting. Uh, there's a French architect named Mansard who used that style roof in France to hide uh, a third floor. And basically, by having that kind of a, of a shape, enables you to put a full-size third floor onto the uh, building. Whereas if you had a peaked roof, you may be able to put a few rooms up there, but it wouldn't be nearly so massive and nearly so many square feet. Just as a minor point to your last statement, uh, Mansard roof, the slopes, as you described, are on all four sides, and Gambrell is, is not. So there, there is a distinction, and and true enough. Aware yes, of I agree. Yes, that's but correct. But in the truest definition, a, a mansard is four sides. It's all four sides. You're right. That's correct. I don't think that's correct. Okay. We, thank you. We, I, I want to hear your response, but we need to know your name too. So if you'll allow us just a few minutes, and we'll ask you to come forward.
Did you have it? Did you? Okay, sorry. Uh, again, I want to thank you for your presentation, and, and I don't want this to sound patronizing to you at all, but I, I think many of your, your ideas are, are, have merit, and, and uh, I think you thought it out well, I think you described it well, um, and, and it's something certainly to consider. Now, can we consider it for this case? Uh, it's my interpretation of the ordinance that we cannot, uh, uh, because the permit was issued. And, and because of that, we can't go back and undo a permit that has been issued. But you could uphold a stop work order. Stop work order was for a specific purpose, and that was height restriction. I think if you look at many of the houses in Cape Elizabeth, Cape Elizabeth has a fairly relaxed building height ordinance uh, in view of neighboring communities. Each, each town has a different ordinance and a different definition. Uh, one that I'm familiar with says 35 feet is the ridge height, period. Uh, the, the ridge of the highest roof ridge cannot exceed 35 feet. Then there's no question uh, that excludes chimneys and antennas and, and decorative type uh, uh, adornments on top, weather vanes and things of this nature, uh, cupola. Uh, 35 foot ridge height. Uh, Cape Elizabeth has a more relaxed, for better or for worse, and, and they look at that as, as the gable end, the mean of the gable end. In absence of the gable end, they look at the hip, which has no gables, the midpoint between the highest point and the drip edge or soffit level of, of the house, the midpoint in, in absence of a gable. Uh, in my opinion, the, uh, the, the gambrel is a gable. That, that, that's whole one gable that is one way to look at it, and that could be looked at it as a roof system, as was described and was alluded to uh, by another board member, that if you drew a line from the ridge roof to the drip edge and straightened out the, the by slopes, the dual slope, look at this as a roof system. But nevertheless, the, the the building permit was issued in, in view of that, in regards to that, and, and, and we have passed that window of, of modifying that. Now, you're saying the stop work order, which was address the height. I was not here. The board addressed that issue, it did determine that the height was in excess and, and that, uh, that that should be adjusted, uh, which took place. And, Barring that, it was my understanding that there was no other uh, uh, hold on the stop work order than, than the height. I'd like other board members' comments, but maybe... If I could just comment on, on my interpretation of the mean level. It wasn't a random interpretation. Oh, absolutely uh, not. I believe it was reached in good faith. When I come on board in 97, um, I questioned that, and, and, and I found out from the town planner the, the history. It seems when, when the ordinance was, was being revised, they looked hard and fast at, 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 at a height definition. And the reason why they didn't go with a 35 foot height to the peak is because they were afraid that people, in order to get that third floor, would put a flat roof on. And, that, and hence, they, they used the mean level to allow somebody to get that next floor but still have an appearance that would be pleasingly more so than a flat roof. So there is some history there um, and some logic. If you went with 35 feet peak to other towns, you could get into a situation where you have a flat roof. Mr. Smith, though, but I guess what the point he raises, which I think has some appeal, is, excuse the pun there, but um, is the fact that it talks about the highest gable or slope, and if you say the highest slope, if you take the mean of the highest slope, which I understand gable to be just another synonym for slope, gable is a slope as I understand from the definition, that when you look at a roof like this, what you're looking at is the highest slope and you're taking the average between the high point and the low point on that highest slope. And I guess my question is, was there any 
history on that particular issue as to why that has been ignored and really the way you're defining it there is really to say mean level of the roof in its entirety. And I just don't see that in the language of the statute. It's much more restrictive than just the mean level of all the slopes of the roof. It talks about the mean level of the highest gable or highest slope. And I guess I'm wondering, is there history? Was that the, was notwithstanding that language, was there discussion, you know, when the ordinance was passed that, you know, we're oh, talking seen, about all, all the roofs? I read that, I read that another way. I read How do you read it? Highest gable. And or, isn't a gable or a slope of a hip roof because there is no gable to a hip roof. There is, I always, my, by looking at the definition, the gable talks about the vertical, the slope of a roof basically, as I understand what a gable is. I, that's how I, I look at that, is, is two sections, highest gable or slope of a hip roof. And, and what, what, is a gable different than a slope? A gable to me is a, is a roof that has a gable end yeah, that stops. Gable end. Right. It's the gable end. So that's why they call it a gable end. That's right. Whereas a, whereas a hip roof does, no, does not have a gable end, and therefore it's, there's no gable. That's why it's not called a gable. So that's, that's been my interpretation. I myself read that sentence a number of times, and, and I'll, for the benefit of the audience, I'd like to read that. The vertical, this is under definitions in the ordinance, uh, zoning ordinance, under the definition section, page six, height, comma, building, the vertical distance from the average original grade to the top of the highest roof beams of a flat roof, or to the mean level of the highest gable or slope of a hip roof. Now, what I had to reread a number of times the word highest. Uh, highest clearly refers to gable. Uh, the mean level of the highest gable or slope of a hip roof. Uh, See, I read that gable, as highest gable or highest slope. But is there a highest slope of a hip roof? No, the hip roof has one slope. Uh, in absence of an end gable, the gables are tilted in and shingled. That is a hip roof. So I would, it, it's my interpretation is that it's the highest gable in a gabled house or the slope of a hip roof mm -hmm. when you have a hip roof. You're correct, Gambrell is not mentioned. Uh, I think one way that I would look at it, right or wrong, it, this is my impression at the moment, that a Gambrell is a subtype of a, a gabled roof. I mean, uh, the picture clearly, if, if, if I were to walk up to the house that's in question or any gambrel type house and say point at the, the gable, paint the gable end of the house, I'd know which side to go to. I'd, even though there was a, an extra bend in it, I would know that that was the gable side. Uh, since it's not a hip roof, then, then I would, again, this is where we were going back to a roof system that is a gable end with the, the midpoint between the roof ridge and the drip edge or the soffit level halfway down, whether there's a one fold or two folds in it. And to, to further uh, add more discussion, uh, we could go back to your mention earlier uh, at the A-frame. If we followed your recommendation, and, and again, I'm not saying it's not without merit, but I think that this needs to be looked at real closely. He could have built, anyone can build a 70-foot gate uh, A-frame. Right. True. And, and be within the ordinance. Now, is that right? No, but, that's but, not. That's but they not could do it under your definition as well. You could build a 70-foot, uh, if you take the average of the roof, you can build a 70-foot building under your definition or under his definition. The reason I believe his definition is correct is because when you're dealing with a flat roof, you only can go to 35 feet. The concept of the statute is they're going to cut you some slack and discourage flat roofs by taking the average of the highest slope, the way I read it. And what that does is, is, is if you think about it, if you go with an A-frame building, you're basically cutting your square footage in half as in comparison to a flat roof. But if you go with a Gambrell roof or a Mansard roof, as they call it, you're basically expanding your square footage 
and by using the distance from here to here as well as from here to here on your Mansard roof, you're basically ending up mimicking almost what is a vertical flat roof situation up to this point. And so I think that statue was purposely designed that way to deal, to take into account all types of roofs. And what you do is you take the highest gable or the highest slope, whatever you want to refer to it as, and it's the average between this point and this point right here on a Mansard roof. And that avoids the situation where you're using um, the, you know, you're basically sort of I'm trying to find a kind word for it, chiseling the statue, chiseling the ordinance to get as much square foot as you can and still come within the 35 feet. So that's the way I read that statute. And I, so for that reason, I feel his point has a lot of appeal. The, the problem I'm having is with the point uh, that the chair has pointed out, Mr. Smith has pointed out, is the 30-day period, which uh, seems to be very difficult in the sense that a permit was issued and maybe some rights have vested. So that's the problem I'm still struggling with. Uh, nevertheless, if indeed the misinterpretation is identified at some point, it needs to be enforced from the, that point on. And as I, I understand that you may not be able to rescind the initial uh, uh, permit. However, to that definition, the, high, the house is not in uh, compliance with the, with the zoning ordinance. And since we're at a juncture now where we're trying to make that judgment, uh, and we've identified that perhaps there's a different way to interpret the ordinance, I believe it's still within your purview, within your scope, uh, to insist that the, the uh, building be brought into compliance according to the correct uh, interpretation of, of the ordinance. Okay. Any other questions or comments? You said you were going to address the second part. So actually, uh, uh, site plan I, review. Were you going to address that? No, uh, Penny Pollard was going to address. Okay. So you have you have completed your. I have completed my statement. Yes. Again, thank you, Mr. Greenberg, for well, your presentation. I I appreciate it. I'm sure we all do. Uh, again, my name is Penny Pollard. I'm the president of the People's Cove Association, and uh, I live at 3 People's Point Lane. Um, you know, I, I think the pickle we're in here is that the code enforcement officer was endeavoring to accommodate the developer, and I understand that that's what your, that that's what the intent is. To, to accommodate? Well, to accommodate the, the developer, to, to make it work for the developer, you know, to sort of... Well, I don't know that I reviewed to make it work. I reviewed based on what the ordinance allows me to do. Okay. So, well, you know, in, in this case, I, I think that there was a lot of pressure on you to accommodate a development, a structure uh, at this location that was very difficult. You don't think so? Where would that pressure have been? If, if, well, uh, if, if I may, we we are still we're, describing the grievance. So yeah, okay. You, Let me just go ahead Mr. with describing the grievance. The you know, I'm I'm just trying to that. establish that there, there, there's an, a lot of awkward things about this. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to address the fact that there's a lot of very awkward things about this particular structure in this particular location. Uh, and that a lot of ordinances are called under scrutiny with this particular structure. Um, I, I believe that a site plan review should have been required. And, and I, I spoke with Bruce about this. We've had this conversation. And he said, you know, site plan reviews are usually reserved for commercial property development. Well, that's something that is listed in the stated purpose of the site plan review. That there's commercial properties are mentioned. However, uh, 
It also states, this is uh, section 19-3-2. Say uh, please. 19-3-2, paragraph B5. And this is what, what, is re, what, what requires a site plan review. New construction involving more than 10,000 square feet of impervious surface paving clearing or vegetative alteration or any combination thereof. Now, that falls squarely to me in the requirement of a site plan review. And, and that, was, that was Bruce's choice to, to not flag a site plan review. I, I think that a site plan review should have required. Um, the area of the lot at 52 Shipwreck Cove Road is listed at 62,390 square feet. The entire lot has now been cleared of vegetation. And this was one of the things that made the whole question of what the original grade was and why the photographs that I have submitted last month were, I think, so significant, is because the, the photographs showed the original grade to be flat or actually a little bit depressed. You know, so we, it's not like we don't have evidence of some of these things um, to question. Uh, the entire lot has now been cleared of vegetation involving an area well in excess of 10,000 square feet and no site review was conducted. The vegetative clearing was not necessary in order to construct the house and may have an effect on the local environment preservation or minimizing the, this is a quote from the ordinance, minimizing the adverse impact on adjacent properties and fitting the project harmoniously into the fabric of the community. That's part of the stated purpose. Now, I have heard from uh, Maureen O'Meara that stated purposes are not enforceable. So if that were the case, then saying that this ordinance was specific to commercial properties, well, OK, that's not enforceable. You know, so you, you can't mention that, that it's about commercial properties, because it, I've, it's been mentioned that that's not enforceable, that the stated purpose of an ordinance doesn't become an enforceable issue. So don't, you know, don't come back now and say, well, this is about commercial properties because we think it's about any property and that the fact that it was just stated in the purpose that it's about commercial properties shouldn't be relevant. But it isn't the appeal period on that 30 days, and that is clearly not within the scope of this last... No, no. I asked Bruce about that, and he said that it can be questioned. Whether or not a site plan review was required can be questioned. What's the, Mr. Smith, what's the procedure? Would, at any point, I may not know that 10,000 square feet were going to be opened up if, if they don't have a master plan. Um, if, if I thought site plan review was, going to, was, was supposed to be applied to residential, I would have requested a site plan from day one so that I could make a determination whether it did need a site plan review. Um, but the appeal of whether I should require a site plan review now has nothing to do with the building permit. If, if indeed it op they open up 10,000 and somebody feels that I erred at this, at this point by not sending it to the planning board now, then, then they have every right to do that. It wouldn't and, be tied and, to the building permit. And the building permit is irrelevant to that determination? Excuse me? The, the, the issuance of the building permit does, and the lapse of the 30 days does not foreclose that issue? No, because of the, the, the clearing was a result of the building permit. Yeah, the, tr it, the trigger was, in fact, that the clearing was done. Correct. And that's what's caused this question. All right. But, but and your point is that, of course, you were never informed that the clearing was going to take place? No, my point is that I wouldn't require a site plan review to see the clearing because I don't believe Section 19, uh, Article 9 applies to residential construction, period. So whether it's 10,000 or 8,000, um, if it does, then I've, I've had it a number of times in, throughout the whole town. Uh, this, I mean, it would require a, a stormwater plan um, mm -hmm. 
it's just something that, that, that I, I had never considered under this ordinance uh, to require because of the wording. It, it lists under purpose assuring that non-residential multiplex residential elder care and similar facilities are designed and developed in a manner which assures blah, blah, blah. So it, do, it doesn't mention residential there and, and, and also it exempts under section B, single family or two family dwelling units. So I didn't think, the, and I still don't think this, this section applies to residential. And, and I, don't, I don't think that it exempts it because it says uh, new construction involving more than 10,000 square feet, clearing or vegetative alteration or any combination thereof. And the purpose, I've been told, is not the enforceable part of the code. The enforceable part of the code is the statement that actually require, you know, the signals, whatever the, the actual ordinance is. In this case, the clearing. You know, I believe that when the application was originally submitted for this development, it should have been immediately apparent that the plans for the structure, which would have indicated, I mean, I'm assuming the plans would have indicated significant vegetative clearing and tree removal, road grading, the relocation of an already existing dweller, dwelling to another position on the property, floodplain considerations because of its position at the base of a hill and on the ocean front. Uh, as well as its enormity and its unusual architecture in the neighborhood, which is otherwise densely housed with homes of significantly smaller dimension. I think all of these things should absolutely have signaled a red flag for a site plan review by the planning board. For, and again, for the record, what section are you referring to in this last description? Um, I'm referring to floodplain ordinances. I'm referring to... Uh, do you have ordinance? The RA ordinance? Section numbers, no. You know, I don't have it with me, I'm sorry. You know, I can... Does anybody have a... You have a copy of the ordinance, right? Sorry? You have a copy of the ordinance? Bruce, you know where the flood it's plan is. The flood plan is a separate document. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I, and I think that the, the, the purpose of the RA uh, ordinance was violated with this as well. And that's another reason that I think a site plan review should have been signaled here. Let me um, interrupt you for one minute. Yeah. Uh, you said that regarding uh, the issue of uh, new construction involving more than 10,000 square feet, uh, that is not part of a permit. That is not applied for typically in a residential building permit or, or uh, even addressed. Is that correct? It, it hasn't been to my knowledge since I've been here or before. In the event that it was determined that that applies after the fact, how would that be addressed? How would the town address that? Oh, certainly. If the board decided that this needs site plan review, then it would have to get site plan review. No, I'm saying, and the ordinance clearly states that site plan review is not required for residential dwellings, period. Okay. And it says that in a number of, several locations in the ordinance, that it is not required for residential. There, there is a reference to excess uh, new construction involving more than 10,000 square feet. Does that apply to residential? It's my interpretation that it does not. It does not. It, it, simply because it's in, in the chapter under Article 9 that states the purpose of the section to begin with. And that's to assure that non-residential multiplex residential elder care and similar facilities designed to develop in a manner which assures adequate provisions mm -hmm. are made for traffic safety and blah 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 so the opening paragraph which section are you referring to section 19 uh, page 196 page 196 article 9 There again, I mean, the wording 
probably could have been done better here too. But okay. uh, under residential, I, Ms. Pollard, just uh, for the clarification of. Uh, Sorry. Excuse me. Sorry. Sorry. For the benefit of the audience and for you, under residential uh, section 19-6-1, residential aid district district regulations under yeah. the uh, article. Would you read? Would you read that purpose? Would you read the? Would you read the purpose? Page 60. Please. Thanks. I'm sorry. Would you read the purpose of the RA development? May, may I complete what I was sorry. saying I first? Uh, under the Article 6 District Regu Regulations, Section 19-6-1, Residential Aid District, or a District, uh, Item F, which is the last item, titled Site Plan Review, the following uses and activities shall be, this is on page 60, shall be subject to Site Plan Review by Planning Board according to the terms of Article 9, Site Plan Review, prior to issuance building permit. Or other multiplex housing or elder care facilities, non residential uses except home daycares, uh, non residential uses listed in 19 6 1C2, any other activities 19 9 2. Uh, so, item F site plan review specifically excludes re single family residential by declaring multiplex or elder care. Now, back to your purpose. Purpose of residential A district includes lands that are outside the built up areas, Cape Elizabeth lands to which public sewers are not expected to be extended in their future, large tracts suitable for farming, woodland production, wildlife. The purpose of this district is to allow residential development that is compatible with the character, scenic value, and traditional uses of rural lands and that does not impose an undue burden on the provisions of municipal services. That is the purpose mm -hmm. of the residential aid district. And to further that reference regarding site plan review, and I'm, I'm, I'm not pointing this out directly to rebut you, I'm just to bring everybody okay. up to date, 19-9-2, um, activities requiring site plan review, the construction of any non-residential or building addition, uh, non-residential extension, multiplex housing, any other activity requiring planning board review, planning board review and the zoning ordinance, new construction involving more than 10,000 square feet of impervious surface, paving, clearing, or vegetative alteration, or any combination thereof. Um, activities not requiring site plan review. Uh, the construction, alteration, enlargement of a single family or two family dwelling unit. Um, there, <clears throat> as part of the building process for a residential single family owner, the town does not require site plan review for obvious reasons of undue expense, time, and all the other things involved with. Uh, stormwater management and all the other issues that are typically associated with commercial uh, or non-residential type dwellings. Uh, uh, it, it is possibly apparent that the 10,000 square feet, there's not, and I don't think it was planned, uh, 10,000 square feet of impervious surface paving. Uh, I think there is a potentially uh, at least a casual appearance of clearing or vegetation, vegetative alteration that Mr. Smith uh, stated earlier that was not part of the building permit or application. Uh, other than that, a site plan review is not, has not been uh, involved with residential construction. So, uh, uh, Bruce, has a site plan review ever been required, ha ever been submitted or ever been required for a residential development? Not to my knowledge, no. And Could have been before me, but I don't, I don't think so. I, I talked to Maureen about this too, and she's never, she couldn't remember a case where, where a, a construction site for single family ever had planning board approval. And there was two other code officers before me that's been here since she's been here in 90, so. 
So when you look at this site and you see that there are, um, you know, volume issues on the lot, there are floodplain issues on the lot, there are um, uh, drainage issues on a lot, there are um, setback issues on a lot, there are, you know, all, you know, height issues on a lot. You just None of these things I indicated to you I that... I review the plans to be in compliance with the ordinance. I don't send them to the plan board, so site plan review for stormwater runoff. Nor, nor would I for a project less than that. You could, have a, you could have a site that's only 2,000 square feet that's on a hill that could affect stormwater runoff on properties much more than this lot. So, you know, it's all relative. Um, the plan board, I don't believe, is in a position, or the town isn't in a position to have applicants for single family come on a regular basis to the plan board. I mean, but that's, if that's the wishes of well, the police that that should come, then, then certainly. This isn't a regular condition. This is not a regular circumstance. This is, you know, I, I let me just address my last point, you know, which is that in order to meet specific setback requirements, with this structure. One side of the house, the north side, is being referred to as the front. And it's clearly a side in its position on the lot. It has no entryway, nor from any architectural point of view could it ever have been seen or intended to be the front of the building. And yet, in order for its overall setback dimensions to fit on the lot, and its required relationship to the abutting home, the north side was allowed to be called the front. For this north face to be called the front, a design change should have been required. In fact, because this was overlooked, an additional five feet of setback on the south side exists, effectively allowing for an additional 250 square feet of dimension to this already outrageously disproportionate structure. You don't, you know, I, I don't see how you get to just call any side of the house that you want to the front in order to get around a zoning rule. I don't um, randomly call. I, I know, but but it was suggested. He, he the applicant came to me to, and asked what what was considered what what the setbacks were, and I had to determine where the front was, and that was my determination. It wasn't random. It was based on the fact that, from my standpoint, it wasn't random. Well, it 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 and had I, to be random. I really this, don't want to defend this because this is a built I understand. issue. I understand. In November. Yeah. I don't see how we get around the, get, you get around the 30-day issue on that particular score. All right, then I'm going to go back to the purpose of the RA, you know, and how this this house, you know, I, there's none of the usual buffer zone one would expect between a building of these dimensions and its immediate neighbor. The structure appears enormously out of place in the very close proximity in which it stands, on one side within 18 feet of an existing home, on another side squeaking in at the required 25 feet. It fairly overwhelms everything in the visible vicinity and beyond. I, it just was simply wrong to allow this permit. The plans, I do not believe the plans for this home were sufficiently scrutinized. I don't believe crucial measurements were taken, and I, I do believe the town zoning ordinances were wrongly interpreted. Um, you know, my, my, I feel like we very much depend upon the zoning board, the town planners, and the code enforcement officer to protect the integrity of our neighborhoods and to allow sound development that's what's in the ordinance that fits in with the current and historic nature of the community. In this case, we strongly believe that there has been a failure, not only to assist in the preservation of the current, current environment at Peebles and Trundy Coves, but an error in judgment in granting permission for the overall peak height of this structure. You know, we've illustrated that this building now stands closer to 50 feet than it does to anything like 35 feet. And, you know, I don't want to go back into the whole foundation height, 
which was never subtracted from the original height of the building, so that the foundation height, from my point of view, because the original grade was never determined, is still standing outrageously above grade, a grade that was never appropriately determined in the first place. You know, and I, I see that, you know, I, I understand that we're being, you know, essentially shut down here because of the 30 days you know, that the permit was issued last November. I think it was stealth. I think it was inappropriate. No building started, no construction started, no lot clearing started on this lot until March. So, you know, I just think that there was a failure on the part of the town to inform us appropriately, give us an opportunity to comment on a structure that is grossly out of proportion with everything in the neighborhood. So I, I think that there's been a violation of, of rules, of law. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. My name is Arlen Rothman, and uh, I live at One People's Point Lane, uh, next to the house in question. I am here to read a letter from another abutter, uh, but prior to that, I would like to just point back to that last issue. The 30-day the issue is of extreme frustration to us as seasonal residents. Uh, the prior owner was a dear friend, and as soon as she became ill and, and, and the, the crossing of, of this property to some other person, uh, it became clear that we were going to need to be on top of whatever was going to happen. And we really did try. Uh, we heard a rumor that the, that the property had been sold, and we went to the office and asked if we could see the plans. We just happened to come out the wrong month. We left uh, with the, the cold weather uh, at the end of October, and I guess uh, it's, it's unclear to me why the town of Cape Elizabeth would require us to have to call on a weekly basis or whatever would have been expected in order to find out exactly what the plans were for the next people coming along. Uh, so that's, uh, I, I'd just like to register that that's a source of, of considerable frustration. I'm sorry, did, did you explicitly say to Bruce that you would like to be informed of plans that might be coming down the road or anything like that? My husband spoke with him, I don't know. I don't remember exactly what the conversation was. I went in and asked whether or not any plans had been submitted. He said no, not at this time. Um, I don't remember if I requested. We, I, perhaps we were naive, but... I just want to make it clear what sure. you're saying there. I, you know, it sounded like you had left notice that no, you know, well, some expectations and... I appreciate, I appreciate the confusion on this, but we live in a town where there is notification if any building is going to happen, whether it's a kitchen behind us or you know, whatever. You That's where we live in our We're permanent perfect. residence. So we simply assumed we'd be notified, and that was an, that was an error, clearly. Uh, so the town might want to think about, uh, about this as a problem in the future, but um, I'm, I'm standing now to speak for Judy Baresi, who uh, lives at 54 um, Shipwreck Cove Road and was not able to be here tonight. So I will read her statement. Dear Zoning Board of Appeals and Mr. Bruce Smith, after the public hearing on this building project and the subsequent application by Drew LLC to alter the building permit, I feel compelled to voice my objections to this project. We've emailed the town council regarding the lack of ordinances to appropriately review a project of this magnitude in such a sensitive area. Three issues that need to be addressed involving this specific project are the following. First, the determination of the front of the lot. Shipwreck Cove Road is a private road which runs from Ms. Tucker's land to our land at 54 Shipwreck Cove Road, a property owned by my husband's company, Syracuse Property LLC. 
The road has existed for probably 100 years, and we have an aerial photo of this road from 1953, clearly showing it transecting the properties now known as 52 Shipwreck Cove Road and 54 Shipwreck Cove Road. The building under construction at 52 Shipwreck Cove Road fronts on Shipwreck Cove Road and has its point of entry on Shipwreck Road. Cove Road, yet Mr. Smith has determined that the side of the lot abutting Ms. Tucker's land with no road frontage to be the front. This determination has allowed Mr. Friedman a setback of only 20 feet rather than 25 feet to the western border of our lot at 54 Shipwreck Cove Road, subsequently enlarging the footprint of his building by about five times 50 square feet. In addition, the footing for his chimney is only about 18.5 feet from our property. Second is the calculation of the height of the roof. As was explained quite eloquently by Mr. Richard Baldwin at the Zoning Board Appeals meeting on Tuesday, June 22nd, a mansard roof line was designed to deceive the French tax assessors in the 18th century, and in the 21st century, it has enabled a 45-foot building to be approved in Cape Elizabeth. By lowering the soffit of the roof, great heights can be achieved. In this case, only the run of the last slope of the roof should have been used to determine the height of this roof. Given the controversy of this project, it would be prudent for the board to get, another, to get other expert opinions on how this roof should be measured, and thus the maximum allowable height. Third, it appears that this building site has had extensive clear cutting. Uh, and so this goes back to that clearing of vegetative alteration and extensive construction of impervious gravel roadway, which in addition to the footprint of the new building and the old building possibly involved more than 10,000 square feet. And I'll just parenthetically remind you that it's 62,000 square feet. This should have triggered a site plan review by the planning board. In closing, it seems obvious that there are many issues at stake which need to be more closely examined in the overall approval process of this building project. Sincerely, Judy Baresi, 3 Oak Knoll Road, Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roth, for your comment. Any other comments from the audience? Please come to the podium. Uh, my name is uh, Robert Amitich. I live at 18 Reef Road, this, which is the corner of Reef Road and Oak Knoll Road. Um, and I, I had a long discussion with uh, Bruce this afternoon with regards to a number of issues that I brought to avoid him, and I, I believe you have a copy of uh, a letter along with items that um, I looked up in the code that I felt might or may, may or may not uh, affect the uh, permitting of this project. Um, I am aware that um, Mr. Smith feels that uh, this project um, and uh, the adjacent project in lot 10. Um, there are three lots involved in my, in my review, which is lot 10A, 10, and 6. Uh, 6 and 10A, I mean 6 and 10 are owned by Bar Paul, Dr. Paul Barassi and uh, Syracuse Property Limited, and 10A is the Drew LLC. My concern here is that um, and I'm not going to go into this because for all practical purposes you're already saying that um, what's happened has happened. Um, my concern here is that there are a number of issues um, in reviewing the overall ordinance manual, the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance. This would be on the end of it, um, there's a list of sections and paragraphs which pertain to this. Um, and I guess my, my feeling, having heard the discussion this evening, is that possibly uh, I would like to request that the Corporation Council for the City look at these uh, questions and items as to errors and omissions with regards to the issuing of this permit. Um, I don't see, um, for example, anything in the code under RA or under shoreline protection that allows for two dwellings on a single piece of property. Um, 
all of these properties that are in question are, for that matter, in, in uh, Shurekas, Trundy Point, wherever, it, are all non-conforming uh, because they do not meet the, the square footage. These three lot, these two lots, uh, 10 and 10A, have no street frontage. Um, it is specific in the in the ordinance that that um, I believe uh, in section 19-3-19-3-2 uh, approvals and permits required paragraphs. J and K discuss private road and access ways, referring to section 19-7-9, private access provisions. Paragraph D discusses procedures. As best as I can determine, the code enforcement officer has no special specific knowledge, nor has the Portland Water District been contacted regarding this matter. This is a serious problem. Would you um, state the, the number again, please? Uh, you've got it in the, in the letter. It's, on, okay. uh, it's in my thing. I just read it from you. Thank you. Um, I, I just highlight that as one of the many issues. I don't see anything. If you want me to read the whole thing, I can. I don't know whether you... No, that's... I don't, I don't think it's necessary. Um, um, and so I think there were things here that should have triggered this being presented to the uh, zoning board. You've never seen this, and as I understand it, until two weeks ago or at your last meeting. Um, I think there are issues here that required your review, uh, if not your review, the planning board review, because that's your discretion as I understand it. Uh, and I think the 10,000 square feet was another one that I brought up here because I don't know what, what does and what does not apply, okay? Um, uh, these are subjective things, and I, I don't want to get into that. But I do feel that um, to that this board owes the community and the and the public um, a responsible and responsive uh, answer to some of these questions, and not say the 30 days has come and gone too bad for you. I don't think that's appropriate. Uh, I think if there's That's, what, that's not what planning and zoning is all about. It's here to protect the rights and, and health and safety and welfare of the community as a whole, not individual projects. And so I have a problem with this. And, and, and in light of that, I, I, I have taken it upon myself to, to pursue the um, private ways. Um, I talked with um, Bob Malley, the public works, and he is not familiar with um, the right of ways or easements through these properties. Uh, he and and um, Bruce Smith said, well, he's seen easements, but the per the people that own the property own the easements. Uh, I pursued it further. Um, I went to the office and and I took down the deeds numbers because I was going to go get copies of all the deeds. And I was informed that at a dollar and a half a page, I might go broke. But what, what private ways are you referring to? I'm referring to the private way from People's Cove. Uh, I believe it's Shipwreck Road, People's Cove Road, and uh, Ocean Avenue. Okay? Which is only access to the property in yes. question. Yeah, yeah. I, under I understand. Thank you. And and and. Um, when I pursued this, I was able to get from the Portland Water District their uh, sewer lines. And there are uh, rights of way, and those rights of way say they shall not be built upon. And there's some specific things there that I think have been overlooked here. And I think that the Section J and K specifically uh, point to 19-7-9, uh, and that requires the fire chief and the road people and everybody to get down there and look at this situation before further construction is done. And I think, um, and that's been ignored uh, as best as I can determine. And uh, uh, I think it is an issue uh, that this board uh, should address. Uh, years ago, uh, probably back in the 70s at this point, um, for those of who might not be familiar, Sure Acres only has one way in and one way out. And back in the 70s, there was a discussion 
with regards to access in, case of, in a case of an emergency if a tree fell across um, the road, the access road. Um, the fire department and public works and the town discussed the possible ability of, it, of going through, extending the road at the top of Broad Cove into the far side of Shure Acres and Oak Knoll Road into Peoples Cove. Those things were abandoned with the future in mind. Uh, in, in lot 10, there is presently a permit for a garage to be built to house 12 cars, six on one floor and six on an upper floor, um, which shows um, the garage being within the easement line. Uh, I don't, as I said to Bruce today, I think that's pretty obvious that there's an encroachment here and should have raised a flag. Um, the garage is located in such a way that to move it off the uh, easement line as, as noted by the architect's drawing, it right would here. be in the setback. We're not discussing okay. garages. We're studying, discussing only 52 shipwreck codes. Yeah, I, I, I understand, but these, uh, what I'm trying to point out is that these properties, you can't get the lot 10 unless you cross 10A and they are dependent upon these rights of way. And uh, I, I think that this, uh, I think that paragraph in and of itself should have required your, your review. I guess I'll stop there. You can look at the rest of this. And the, the, what, what was the last, was it something specific that requires our review or, or everything you mentioned? The, your last statement, I'm sorry. Oh, oh my last statement is, was with regards to um, the rights of way and access ways. And that is, uh, that is referred to, um, again, in my, my notes, um, uh, uh, basically in 19-3-2 uh, on the pro uh, permits and approvals. And item uh, paragraph J is construction of existing uh, private roads and K, construction utilizing private access ways. And they both refer to section 19-7-9, and there's a process there. It, depending on, I don't know whether these are private ways or private access ways. There's two different things, but certainly the implication is that the board and the town w should have looked at this. And I think that should have been done before the permit was issued. That's it. I want to thank you, Mr. Armitage, for your presentation and uh, your lengthy handwritten written, uh, interpretation. Uh, unfortunately, we just received that when we arrived tonight, and that's why we were a few minutes late getting started. I was trying to skim over it, but thank you very much for your input. Sorry, Mr. Chapman. I, I, I'm glad he brought that thing up about the private access ways because that was something that I looked at. Um, it is a private access way, and there are specific things that are required when development occurs on a private access way that I don't have any sense was addressed. No, it, yeah, not only for new construction on an undeveloped lot. The private access ways can just kick in, and that's site plan review for an undeveloped lot. For an undeveloped lot. Correct. And this was a developed lot? Both of them are developed lots. Not where you cut off the vegetation down the next to me. Well, uh, one lot, there's two lots there, both of which have single, had single family dwellings on them. So, so they're developed now. lots. Two houses now. Okay, what about the bisected yeah. lot issue? The, the cottage back in back that he moved is not, cannot be used for dwelling. You can have plumbing, you just can't have a kitchen. You can have a kitchen. Well, it's not going to, though. Oh, it's just an accessory building. Right? So you're not calling that a house then, is that correct? It's not a house. Because it doesn't have a kitchen? <laughs> it's not going to have a kitchen. And that's why it's not a house? Right. You can, you can have a, a, a separate building with, with bedrooms or anything you want. I mean, there's no audience that says you can't do that. You just can't have dwellings. And as far as you're concerned, then it would not be considered a house? Sometimes. If it doesn't have all the ingredients that meet the definition of a dwelling in the would, ordinance, would, would you no. would you like to come to the podium? And you're welcome if you'd like. Thank you. <clears throat> I got a.
problem with this dwelling unit and there's no I've been up and looked at this. This is a house that's been moved 50 yards back up the road. It, and, and it was, it was t I was informed that it was a guest cottage now, I, I'm assuming. I'm, I feel like none of these issues have got to do with what that's was right. before the board. I don't want to sound like I'm pushing this, but I feel like I'm on trial on another bunch of issues that's not even before the board. Bruce, you're not. I, I, think, I think, Mr. Chairman, we need to move this conversation okay. along. I, I just we're critiquing things that uh, have no bearing on what's been brought to us tonight. I agree. Once again, I understand the emotional We do. We all understand that. Involved, but it's all not within the town. purview of our governing. We are a, a governing body within the town. Any other? Is it, is, let me, a quick question as a point of information. Is it uh, reasonable for this group to request the town's cooperation council to look at these items? Sorry. To clarify to clarify whether they, there has been an error and omission on the part of the issuance of this permit. I believe the way you tee those up is you file, as Ms. Um, Pollard did there, file a appeal to this court of an issue. I mean, we just don't receive letters the day of the hearing. No, no, no. No, I understand that. And you I, tee it up that way. It just hasn't been properly teed up by you. What are you saying to me? That you can, in fact, bring it to this board. You're, you become an applicant. You participate early. We get the information. You come in. You give testimony, whatever. And then the board takes a vote on what it is you asked us to consider. So that my letter to you dated this date can come up at the next meeting? We're, we're addressing one specific appeal. No, no. I, to, that's not to be, that's not relevant to our, our agenda tonight. Yeah, as I understand it, the only appeal before us tonight is the one that was put forth with respect to the height and site plan issue. That's it. But Len, can he, in fact, make an He can file a separate application down the road and, right. I mean, as I understand okay. it, we're not ruling on the issues you've brought up. That's correct. It, it, it just wasn't on the agenda. That's correct. Right, so that answers. But is it, isn't it appropriate to understand that we are not able to change any of the regs here? This is a That's correct. planning board issue. Uh, so to, you know, prolong this thing. Yeah, I don't mean to imply it that. It doesn't solve the problem. Sir, I don't mean to imply that we have the power to do anything about the issues you're raising. The only thing I don't even think we can get to the basic commentary period on it at this point because no, there's nothing on the agenda to address that. Uh, it, okay. He may be very very well correct that you have to go to the planning board or it may be too late on some of these issues and, and uh, Mr. Smith and the, and, um, and the planning board may have more input on that. Any other comments? Please. Again, if you will kindly restrict that to the appeal on the agenda. Yes. Hi, I'm Jim Mora from 5 Wombeck Road. 5 Wombeck? Yes. Okay. And I believe that the fixes for the height problem that we discussed last month are insufficient. First of all, I agree with the earlier arguments that the height should be given by the, the max, this highest slope of the roof as we discussed earlier. So I just want to reiterate that I believe that point. But second, this particular structure does not fit in with the character of the neighborhood, which I believe is part of the ordinance. And, but at the same time, I understand that the permit was given. But as we come up with a fix for the height problem, we have taken the structure which does not fit in with the character of the neighborhood and we've made it worse. We've made it more not fit in with the character of the neighborhood. We have actually flattened off this structure. We have lopped the top of it off. And so now, as we discussed earlier about the fact that the reason why the ordinance doesn't have 35 feet, but it's because we didn't want a third story, we've actually made this building more like a flat roof. It is lowered. It is lowered, but it is not coming in more with the character neighborhood. And even though, because the permit was given, structure is the way it is, I believe any fix should bring it, if not more in character with the neighborhood, at least not make it 
more out of character with the neighborhood. So my point is that I, don't, I believe that the fixes to lower the building height are insufficient in that it has made the building more out of character with the character of the neighborhood, and I believe that it should. Thank you. Any other comments? Can I just make a closing comment? Uh, the discussion here has gone quite far afield, and we do want to uh, go back to the actual appeal here. So just as before you go off and, and consider it, please remember that we believe that uh, building is not currently in compliance. It needs to be determined whether or not it is in compliance, and in doing so, you must determine what the, the height of the building is, and you must use the correct interpretation of the ordinance in order to make that determination. And if you realize that there is a better uh, interpretation than the one that's been used to date, and I believe that that's what needs to be applied today in determining whether or not this building uh, meets, is in compliance with, uh, with the zoning ordinance. Thanks. Thank you again, Mr. Greenberg. Any other comments? Uh, hearing none, we'll close the session to public forum section of, of the meeting and open it to discussion by the board. Again, I, I'm concerned about what our jurisdiction is. And you, you, can you uh, go back through your original premise to us? I mean, I, we're talking about something that's, that, that was part of a, a ruling permit that was issued last year, the height that was determined, and now we're having a suggestion made that we change the rule or the methodology that was employed when that particular permit was issued and the investment or the vesting that has been made by this particular property owner is enormous in more than, more than one way from what I've heard tonight. I, I just, I, I'm wondering what our jurisdiction is here relative to this particular issue. I mean, uh, it's beyond the 30 days. I mean, I also heard one individual indicate that they, when the property had changed hands, they had become very aware, but then left town and things didn't happen uh, the way that they thought they should, come back to town and find this thing well underway. I, I just, I'm just a little bit concerned about we're all looking back in retrospect and saying lots of things didn't happen the way they should, but in reality they happened. Uh, and I'm just not so sure that I can feel in good conscience that we can change the rules retrospectively. Um, on a go-forward basis, there may be some significant learning from what has taken place and for the town to consider or for us to consider relating back to either the town council or to the planning board. But I just don't know where our jurisdiction begins and ends relative to what we've heard here tonight. Uh, I don't know whether I, I, I'm certainly willing to listen to my colleagues as to whether I'm not on the right footing here, but I, I, just, uh, I, I just can't imagine uh, essentially using a new set of guidelines to determine height at this point relative to a project that was permitted last year. I fully understood what we did last month and I thought it was very appropriate and I voted in the affirmative in terms of that action but I, I just, I don't know, I just asked for some guidance from my colleagues because I'm uh, a little concerned. Well, I have a similar concern uh, with respect to the 
30 day issue clearly in my view all the issues are pretty much foreclose the only one that seems to me to trouble me some or the only issue that seems to me to have any prayer of still being alive is the height issue because of the fact that there was a cease and desist order issued and then a an appeal of that decision and a review by this board and then a decision to appeal the the revoking of that cease and desist order when the builder complied with whatever requirements that Mr. Smith put in place at that point in time so I guess that's the only place where I can see any issue but I agree with you I struggle with the same problem I mean the second issue I don't know whether you want to treat one separate from the other but I mean the vegetation question that's been raised here is a significant one granted it's an opinion it's not based on any landscape architects review of what took place in that I mean does that have a prayer and do we have jurisdiction with that accusation or concern or to go back and say we'd like a site plan at this point to determine next steps and to make sure that what gets done from now till when this project is complete will in fact fulfill the character and the nature of what these ordinances were put in place to provide I mean I don't know I mean it's it's a that's that's another area where I struggle is but can we as a board vote to have a site plan done because we believe that this I mean I don't know yeah I'm not sure what the remedy is there it's kind of water over the dam at this point in the sense that the property has been stripped well well except that I build enough projects in the commercial side with people have come in and asked us to to submit additional plans on a go forward basis and and not and not dig a hole or put a trench in or do whatever until such time as the local authorities have been satisfied so I mean I you know I that's just a you have every right to to answer that question and if you and if the board believes that that the audience requires site plan review for residential clearing of 10,000 square feet or more and that's the direction I will inform the applicant that he needs to seek such site plan review and it'll take measures for for whatever that section requires even though it's after the fact if that's but you got to determine whether the audience requires that to happen and if you do then then we'll send them to the planning board that's not are you in agreement that more than 10,000 square feet has been disturbed or I I because I believe the audience didn't require site plan review I didn't go down and measure it I would suggest that that somebody would have to to make that determination and if indeed there was more than 10,000 and and the board determined that section 19 whatever that is 9 applies then certainly applicant would be informed that he has to go through a process with the site with the planning board do you know the square footage approximate of the lot 62,000 something 53 62,000 and the cottage has pretty much been pulled from one end to the other it looks like right that's correct and Bruce this can't be done under one permit there's a there's a permit issued for the house and then there's a permit issued for the garage slash cottage but the cottage was there's a permit to move the cottage right but it's a garage in essence once no there's a garage on a separate lot that's unrelated project separate from so three permits have been pulled for this well two on this property is it the garage is on another property belonging to somebody else nothing to do with this the fair to say you could have moved the cottage without disturbing the terrain is it I don't know well that's the question you know you know we gave a permit for him to do something and therefore he did it and in the process we were left with the disturbed plant life there but a site plan like I say you still got to determine whether it needs a site plan review well the site plan review after the fact that's what you determine could require the applicant to do take measures to 
restore that if indeed it applies. That was going to be my question. The, it's my impression that a site plan review at this time would direct, address vegetation only, since that is uh, the only portion that appears that possibly was violated, and it specifically excludes residential construction. So site plan review would not have anything to do with the construction of the dwelling. That's correct. Which I is my understanding is the, the probably the primary and foremost grievance here tonight. I think where the discussion of a site plan review would end is where it doesn't apply to anything. It doesn't it doesn't apply to a residential dwelling. Correct. And after that, any further discussion? Yeah, but Except if there is, that, it, it, yeah, well, sorry. Go ahead. Except yeah. that when they've, but the, the presentation has been made to us that if you read the actual text, that the vegetation or the disturbing of that vegetation to the tune of 10,000 square feet or whatever does trigger a question. So I, I think that, you know, again, it's, it's interpretation. Mm -hmm. If one believes I've been down there and I, you know, I, I'm not a landscape architect, but I would say there's been more than 10,000 square feet disturbed Easily. in the process of moving one, this property. Jim, but isn't, isn't it true, and Bruce, I'd be interested in your comments, almost every residential project then would require site plan approval because just about every project involves a combination of, you know, moving grade, stripping trees, you know, does that mean when you strip a top of a hill and put a lawn in, is that then trigger that provision? I don't know about every, but there's a good many projects in, in the town of Cape Elizabeth that, that would fall under this category if indeed residential is included, yes. It would um, be a lot of work for the planning board. They, not to say that they, I mean, that's what they volunteer for, but it would be something that, uh, well, you know, <clears throat> that's a 100 by 100 lot, which is pretty common. And they, they become heavily disturbed during the construction of a standard. Yeah, I guess it, you're right. It'd probably be a lot more than I even thought of. 100 by 100? Yeah. It's 10,000, isn't it? Yep. Good. Yeah. Whew, I hate to make that mistake. Yeah. Uh, Virtually everything in Cross Hill would probably be. <laughs> Cross Hill, every lot would probably require a site plan review then. <clears throat> I don't believe that was the intent of the ordinance. I mean, I can understand the concern. Um, the, one, the one thing I would like to go back to briefly is this height, height issue. I mean, the one thing at the last meeting we did make very clear, I think, is that this board was not telling them how to come in, become in compliance with the height restriction. In other words, we appeal was made to his decision to stop work, and the only thing this board did was to uh, deny their appeal, uh, requesting that that be lifted. I don't think at that time we really made a decision as to how one complies with the height restriction. And to further that, the definition that we were discussing earlier of the mean height, which would directly apply to that. Yeah, I mean, we just didn't decide What's the proper interpretation of that at that point in time? If you recall about last month's meeting, too, the discussion was lengthy, and very much of it was focused upon the site work, and very little was uh, about the building's height, where contrasting tonight, it's been entirely about the height. It, it just it seems unusual that it's, um, and actually, I think I raised it, and it's in the minutes, is that yeah. if we all pretty much agree that the building's the physical height of the building from the foundation footing up was not questionable. It was the site work that was done in terms of placing in the uh, foundation. So why did yeah, I don't, I don't, I didn't think we, we just, my understanding of what we did last time was we made a decision that it was more than 35 feet. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, I, I agree with that as well, but. Regardless of how you calculate it. Right. I agree with that as well, but it just seems like it's, basically two bites at the apple in the sense that the argument last month was heavily dependent upon the site work or the lack thereof that brought the building above 35. And tonight, it's been entirely about the structural height from the footings up. 
So primarily it focuses around how to determine grade. Yeah. That's really where it all started. Mm -hmm. Original the building grade. is always one one height from right. from the from the foundation that, up. That's right. I think we're we're at the end we, we determined that the foundation was poured without a lot of uh, attention to where it was in height. And in fact, that's that's when we decided to. Uh, and that's how we arrived at because the plans initially called for a three foot footing, uh -huh. three foot foundation wall, yep. Yep. and the, the person who poured the, the footing inadvertently used the four foot yes. foundation. But in fact, we, we did have a, a pretty lengthy discussion about about the structure, and we, we in fact we talked about the roof. In fact, in the minute, Mr. Greenberg uh, went through a, a very a short synopsis of Correct. what he just presented tonight. But in fact. Uh, you know, we did cover that as well. So I mean, was the height and relative to the structure was also was also there. Can I make a clarification on that? Um, as you pointed out, I did bring up the point. Would you approach the podium? I'm sorry. So that the sure. television audience you want, can hear you. Want to read the minutes here? How they describe what you said, or uh, sure. Why don't you, yeah, just so you, you can understand my point. It says, uh, Mr. Bill Greenberg. Uh, uh, Preble's uh, People's uh, Point Road and closest to the new home stated that there is an opportunity to find the original grade and there is ground with grass mowing on it within three feet of the foundation. He also stated that there is another interpretation of building height in the zoning ordinance. He said that it is the mean level of the highest slope of the roof, which would be halfway from the peak to the first bridge. I guess it says bridge, but I think it means bridge. Uh, he does not believe it should have been in the first place. Right. That's essentially what. That's right. And and that's just a, a very brief uh, summary of uh, what I went into more depth here. And essentially, the point that was made to me at that point was that since I was an appellant and and they were focusing on uh, what the original grade was, that my discussion should be put off till later. And so here it is. We've reached the two-hour point. I uh, would like to recess for an exact five minutes, and we will. We shall resume. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? The notice uh, issue that came up here for discussion, and I'm not sure what we as a board can do to um, to activate either the town manager or someone to look at the concept, but we have a website. It just seems to me that on maybe on a weekly basis, whatever, we could populate that website with all building permits or applications or whatever, or some combination, even if it was for butters or whatever, that you could just get on the website from wherever you are, because a lot of folks in Cape Elizabeth don't live here all year round. Uh, and this would certainly alleviate or eliminate this issue of having this happen while people are not in town. So I don't know how we move that to somebody to consider, but it seems like a pretty uh, interesting concept and one that I think would satisfy. Uh, and I guess it's learning from this situation that you know, on a go forward basis, we have a website. Let's make it work for us in the, uh, in the building department. I, I think that's a fantastic idea, and that would be a perfect way to address it. Just otherwise, the only way it, the public or the folks in the surrounding, uh, surrounding properties to these type of projects would be notified if, it be, if it's slated to become before the Board of Appeals. So something like this basically remained under the radar for a little bit too long. But utilizing the website would be a fantastic way to do this. And again, when people come to Bruce, part of the conversation can be, look, you know, check the website. You know, it takes the burden off you in some ways, but administratively it has to be done. I've never had a problem with website or, or courier for posting, but that's not the policy. So it's either got to be a policy change or an ordinance change in order for, for us to be allowed to So how do we do how do we at least pursue that? any any citizen or or, or or letter from the board can can write to the council or, or sit down with the manager and, and, and pursue that? I, I think that should be a matter for either the chair or the secretary to um, advance it to the um, the council. I would second that motion. Thank you for the comments. Back to our appeal at hand.
I think many of the comments made this evening were quite valid. I tend to agree and support with the concept of, of many of the ideas. Uh, there's some issues that, that are difficult to address, uh, one of which is the, the character of the residential A, which was, was addressed. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, our ordinance does not define that, so it becomes very subjective. Uh, purpose is to uh, compatible with the character. Uh, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but without specific guidelines, it's it's difficult for us to to uh, establish that. And and as an example, I know some communities, some towns, define that quite clearly, uh, in the sense that they will dictate size, shape of houses, what materials can and cannot be used for roofing, siding. Uh, what colors or what colors from a color palette can be used for siding and trim and, and on and on and on becomes quite restricted. Uh, we, our ordinance does not address any of that. Uh, if you stand back and look at, at the house that was uh, uh, suggested in the plan, and I, and I mentioned this in, in response to, to the uh, ideas that were set forth this evening. That is a shingle-style house. Uh, it has a gambrel roof. Uh, it's permitted for houses, according to our ordinance, to be higher than 35 feet, uh, all of which could be described as, as uh, residential in nature. It's quite large, very large. Uh, the site, the, the, that is addressed in the ordinance uh, specifically by impervious ground cover uh, restriction, which in residential A is 25%, and shoreland performance overlay district is 20% impervious ground cover. And that would include the footprint of the house, any driveways, uh, sidewalks, anything impervious that is not natural and growing after the fact. All that is addressed, uh, but the, the magnitude and the size and the visual impact of the house is, again, I'll emphasize, fortunately or unfortunately, is not addressed in the ordinance. So our charge of the board is to look and interpret the ordinance. And if we start building in subjective definitions as to scenic and traditional use, then I think that that could, uh, that could become difficult for us, for anyone trying to build a home, in the sense that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, without specific guidelines, that's difficult for me to interpret. Uh, on the other side, I hear exactly what every one of you are saying. And I, I feel your concerns. What I am wrestling with is that, according to the ordinance, if this had been brought before us in the allotted 30-day time frame, I don't think there would have been any question as to what to do and how to do it. Nine months later, we're faced with a, with a, a significantly different issue. Um, and that is, any decision that we make, we have to assume that it will, can and will be appealed and taken up to higher courts. And will higher courts support our decision? Uh, and the item of the ordinance that keeps coming back to most of our mind, every one of our minds on the board, is that that window for appeal is 30 days. Now, 
I don't think anyone will argue with the fact that and raise the question, how do I know? How do I know the permits? Uh, it's public record in the, in the town hall. It's easily obtainable if you make it an effort to come up to a town hall every week or every other week. Uh, uh, I'm just using this as an example, I'm not suggesting it. Other than that, there is no mechanism. The town does not report building permits. It doesn't report real estate sales. It doesn't report police summons and on and on and on. I mean, uh, the local newspapers do uh, because they send a reporter up to the town hall and gather that information and publish it because they feel like it's of, of interest. The town uh, has not in the past and uh, uh, voluntarily published or made this either available to the newspaper or on the website. And that is a different issue. Uh, mm -hmm as was addressed earlier. Uh, building permits are a public record and they can be reviewed uh, ad lib. Uh, so from that standpoint, the issue that I am wrestling with, and it's the only issue that I'm wrestling with, is that the window for us to take some action, and especially significant action, that is what in apparently is requested by the audience and many members is that uh, uh, we pass that window. And we, I'm having trouble dealing with the fact that my charge as a member of this board is to interpret the ordinance. And again, I think every one of your statements has validity. Nine months later, what can we as a board do about it? Now, this is my personal feeling. Uh, and I'm, I'm wrestling with that. The, the, my understanding at the last meeting, which I was not here, is that the primary contention of the last meeting was original average grade or average original grade, not building height, as was mentioned earlier. That was addressed, and instead of lowering the river, raise the bridge, the, the, the one fixable point of that was to adjust the house structure, since the original average grade, grade cannot be changed. I have a different issue tonight that is being brought up, but again, in an effort to continue the stop work order. Based on my understanding, I have difficulty applying it at this late date. And, and that's what I'm struggling with at the moment, is that the ordinance does not give me a nine month window to address this. Um, I'll jump in, I guess. Um, I just want to say that um, first with regard to the character and sort of magnitude of this building, it, it does trouble me tremendously um, that we have a structure like this. I don't fit, feel that it fits within um, sort of the anticipation or in the intent of the statute. I do think Mr. Greenberg's interpretation of the high slope is the accurate one and that um, by allowing this averaging of all the slopes, uh, it allows for the gross square footage of this um, particular uh, building to be even greater than uh, what I think was anticipated under the statute. Um, so both the character and the height I am very troubled by. Um, I also have sympathy for the point that was raised before about the, the frontage of the building. What is the actually the frontage of the building? Is it where the road comes in or is it something else? Um, but to be honest, I haven't been able to fully understand that issue completely enough and I don't think it's properly before us today to do anything about on that issue. Um, on those two issues, um, I think that the problem with all that is, as the chair pointed out, we have the 30-day requirement and I think that does, <coughs> is a very difficult issue 
to deal with and overcome because in all fairness to this app not to this applicant to this builder he was dealing with an interpretation that mr smith would bruce smith put forth that he relied upon in good faith to proceed forward came before this board one time um to get that modified uh, his appeal was refused and then based upon uh, the interpretation he received from Mr. Smith after that fact, he has already reconstructed this roof one time. So I see that as a very difficult hurdle to overcome. Uh, and then with regard to the third issue, which is the site plan, I do agree with um, the applicant's interpretation that I don't see any restriction under 19.9-2 um, to limit that to merely commercial space. Um, it seems that it can be applied to residential as well. While I hate to see that applied to every single residential unit uh, and every single residential applicant that comes forward to get a building permit, um, the magnitude of the site um, destruction and site modification and the moving of a unit from one location to the other, et cetera, strikes me as triggering uh, the need for some kind of plan to understand how this road and the various uh, runoffs and other issues associated with this site are going to be dealt with in the future. So I would be in favor of, at the very least, requiring some kind of plan to come forward to deal with those issues. Uh, I guess I'll, uh, I'll just, uh, I don't want to reiterate the, the, the same points. However, I, I too struggle with the fact that that 30-day window has come and gone, and uh, it concerns me that we're trying to apply a consistent application of the zoning ordinances in this town. Uh, and I do want to highlight the fact that we've had three zoning officers over the period of time, 15 years, and the application of what we are faced with here has been done consistently over that time frame. And to come into tonight's meeting and suggest we use a different methodology, I think, is troublesome. Um, I do feel that the town council is a place that someone can go if they wish to have things looked at. Um, certainly, if this is a methodology or a process or whatever, I would I would encourage any citizen to bring it to their councilor and and have them consider what the next steps are. As far as the site plan is concerned, I've been down there, and I do think that we do need to um, to hone in on exactly what is the plan to restore this uh, this site, uh, because it, it 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 did take quite a beating to have the moving of, of a cottage in it uh, at the length of uh, the distance that was uh, required. Um, but but I, I too on the first issue have a concern about the timeline and what we really can or can't do as a board and uh, and I and I'm uh, very pleased to have people feel that they can come to us. Um, I just uh, want people to understand that we came here tonight open-minded enough to listen to what you have to say, but we have some restrictions as to what we can or can't do, and uh, the 30 days, in my opinion, has come and gone. Any other comment? Would you please suggest to the board your viewpoint of the uh, how we would word the site, the 10,000 square foot issue regarding the, the, the vegetation. How would you reword? No, how would you? Word a motion, I believe, is word a motion in regards to, actually it is, it, it's a, a bipart, two-part grievance. Well, I think that the question as to why a site plan review was not required, I think you need to just make a determination whether it was required or not based on, on the ordinance. It's as simple as that. You don't have to do a motion necessarily. You can make a determination as to whether it applies or not and base your findings on the following reasons. And then once we determine there's a site plan required, the statute takes care of what goes into a site plan. That's a term of art 
uh, and the, uh, that's fleshed out by the statute and obviously discussions with you. Keep in mind that, that you, can't re you can't necessarily require a site plan review for this only. But if you determine that the ordinance requires site plan reviews for 10,000 square feet or more for residential, that that's what will be administered from this day on for all residential structures that open up 10,000 square feet or more. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you can't, I don't believe you can go and say this one needs it and nobody else needs it. What, what, what's wrong with that statement? No, so there's a point. Um, would you approach the oh, sorry. Uh Go into the uh, ordinance and look at it carefully. In Article 9, I believe it is. Um, it does say where it is and is not required. So it's not required for the construction of a single family dwelling. Okay. That's the. And I didn't say that. I understand. So my point is so it's not required if you're clearing land for the footprint of the house. That's, well, well that's what the board right. determined. Okay, so this is my Where point. Where do you get that point, sir? If you look in Article 9, um, at, towards the beginning, where it says what is where it is required, then there's a section immediately after that says, this is where it is not required. And Section A and F following that says for single family dwellings. So you're right. So my, so my point is that clearing land strictly for construction of a house doesn't require any kind of a site plan review. If you have in excess of 10,000 square feet not associated with that construction, which is the case here, and you clear or modify the vegetation, put in parking lots, roads, etc., that's when I believe, at least in my opinion, that's what triggers the need for a site plan review. So I don't think you're opening it by ruling that you require a site plan review in this case. I don't think that you're going to require it for all single family dwellings. In, in, in my reading of the ordinance. And the distinction being the fact that this is a situation where we're dealing with the moving of one house from one location to another. Right, Th that was the cause, <clears throat> but in particular, this is a 62,000 square foot uh, lot. It has approximately a 2,500 square foot footprint for the house itself. But exclusive of that, in excess of 10,000 square feet was modified. In this case, because it, they had to move the house, but it wouldn't matter what the, the, the reason was, they just modified it. Your, your point, I understand your point. But it's my impression that this is, what you're talking about is not addressed under site plan review, it's addressed under Shoreland Performance Overlay District or maximum building impervious ground cover in a residential a building site. It, it may now, also address it there, but I think Everything I, that, sorry? No, I, I know what you're talking about. Well. But the clearing. I'm not sure you do. Okay, let me restate it so that and then correct me if, if mm -hmm. you feel that I'm still in error. Uh, it, it's mentioned in the sentence with surface paving, clearing, or any combination of that. Correct. Uh, sure, anytime you build a house, you're going to wipe out any living growth within a significant huge area of, of the structure. Right. Uh, and even more than what your ultimate driveway and sidewalks and everything, I mean, it just, it, clear cuts the area. I mean, we all know that in, sure. in many construction. The Shoreland Overlay District dictates that, which, which this happens to fall under, that when all the dust settles, 80% of the lot has to be green and growing. Right. Can't be gravel, can't be sidewalk, and on and on and on. So I think that, in, in my mind, that is what is the overlying dictation or dictating effort of the intent of the ordinance here is not whether 10,000 feet was disturbed because I assume he's not going to leave it dirt. It's, it's going to revegetate. He cannot cover it. He, uh, any, the, the, the construction, he cannot pave it, cover it, gravel it, or do anything else. It has to be natural vegetative growth. Purpose was for water to percolate into the land, obviously. 
so yes, it was disturbed, but not to create a parking lot. And, right. and maybe I'm interpreting that wrong, but since that is, that is listed as one of the items, all the other ones of which deal with multiplex, elder care, non-residential, all which would have necessary and associated parking lots and, and background facility for emergency vehicles and on and on and on, that dumpster right. and things of this nature. So I would assume that the, what you are saying is correct, but the overriding factor would be the 20% impervious ground cover after the fact. And that applies to, um, but the particular uh, paragraphs that we were looking at just talks about clearing it or disturbing it, um, I think, as even in process, whether it comes back or not. Does it, uh, can, it doesn't say disturbing, I don't believe. Well, can I, uh, I I'm working for memory. Of course. If. Right, so, so it's uh, clearing or vegetative alteration or implementation thereof. New, new construction involving more than 10,000 square feet of previous surface pavement clearing, etc. So clearing or vegetative alteration. So I, I believe that that's any time during uh, the process. And then here in B1, this is where it says that you shall not require site plan for the construction, alteration, or enlargement of a single family or two family dwelling. So that's why I say it, it's exclusive of the footprint itself, but uh, the rest of the lot is what is addressed in the five. My interpretation. <coughs> This is where it gets muddy, is what we decide tonight for future cases that come before us have to be interpreted upon the same premises. Whatever we do here moving forward has to be enforced the same every time. Mm -hmm. So can you, can you make a motion to, to, uh, to, to give this to town council and render an opinion? I mean, is that a... Sure, job. What's that? That's your job. That's my job. Yeah, we're the ones who, we're the board who interprets this, at least at this level. We can seek a legal opinion from our town council. Excuse me? We can seek a legal opinion from our uh, town attorney. You can. Well, the, the, my only contest to that is that, that activities not requiring site plan review. The ordinance clearly states it's a single family and it does not list an exception. Mm -hmm. It just says not the following activities shall not require site plan approval. S parentheses, certain of these activities may however require the own owner to obtain a building permit, plumbing permit, or other state and local approvals. Number one, under activities not required, the construction, alteration, or enlargement of a single family or two family dwelling unit, including accessory building structure. So, yes, 10,000 feet was possibly disturbed or altered as a term. Cleared, it was cleared, and it was altered. But for us to start requiring site plan reviews for residential construction, not knowing that 10,000 feet is going to be disturbed or possibly be disturbed, or how will it be determined without getting a surveyor out to establish that, uh, this could ultimately impose a significant financial burden on someone wanting to build a house. Just just a random thought. Uh, not a random thought, I think. A significant thought. Uh, it has never been applied in the past. T take a drive through Cross Hill. It's about, those are 10,000 square foot lots. 
Well, we're not talking about lot size. Those, no, those are all conforming lots, so they're all in excess of 80-something thousand feet, according to... No, actually, they're not. It's, no, it's it's cluster cluster development. Sorry. They start it's out smaller than It's open that. space. So Density. They're yeah, small. 10 or 15,000. And my point there is the entire lot is disturbed. It's altered. I mean, if you look at... Altered during the if you go back to, to number five, it says new construction involving more than 10,000 square feet. New construction. And then, and then it goes from previous surface paving clearing or combination thereof. How can you say that you take out the building because that's not part of that? I mean, it, I, I don't really want to have to, on a daily basis, decide what is included in the 10,000 and what isn't either. That's a heck of a position to well, be into. I think that's a valid point. It says new construction in excess of 10,000 square feet. So if a building permit is applied for, where construction is going to exceed 10,000 square feet. Uh, it I have no appear. problem sending an applicant to the planning board for, for, for residential construction, but don't, don't put me in a position where I have to decide. Either they, either they, all, either they go because it's 10,000 square feet opened up, or they don't go because it doesn't apply. I think it's as simple as that. Read that line again. Did you say it's uh, new construction in excess of 10,000? New construction involving more than 10,000 square feet of impervious surface, paving, clearing, or vegetative alteration or any combination thereof. I see. An impervious surface could mean impervious surface is a building, I mean, by definition. Or a gravel driveway. Impervious surface definition is anything that impedes a natural infiltration of water to its use or design. So it's something that will still mm -hmm. absorb water still could be impervious because it's because of its use being packed or its design. So that's a typical definition on the shoreland zone which 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 requires anything such as a gravel driveway to be included. Mm -hmm. Structures. Why couldn't we limit it? And you're, can't we limit that decision to situation, or could we limit the decision to a situation where we have a unique situation like this where